All right, welcome everybody to our uh, study session. Uh, this is a meeting of the Vancouver School Board of Directors. It is October 25th at 5.30. Um, we are going to go ahead and get started with our study session tonight by um, starting with roll call. Uh, Director Zavala. Here. <laughs> Director Decker. I'm here. Director Smith. Here. And Director Sproul. I believe she might, she's off camera. She might, she let me know she might be a couple minutes late to our meeting. Um, but I know she is um, listening and in attendance. Um, we do have quorum uh, to go ahead and start the meeting. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Snell for um, our agenda tonight. Thank you, Director Barros. Um, welcome this evening. Uh, we're glad that you're tuning in either live or um, uh, watching the recording of this session. Uh, we have three uh, topic items for um, the board this evening uh, related to three different uh, goal areas uh, for the board. Uh, the first is culture and climate, and we have a student advisory report. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, and then we have a uh, formative assessment, our first fall uh, check-in um, and under the student learning goal. And then finally, a report from the multilingual learning team um, and looking at some potential um, uh, just a uh, programmatic expansion over the, the next few years and sharing some information with the board and seeking some input and feedback as well. Um, so if, if it's okay, Director Barrow, so just proceed into the topics. Okay. Yes, that's that's fine. So the, the first one under culture and climate, as we've mentioned before, um, last year the uh, students came together and helped develop a student advisory. And this year um, they're working on a joint project with you um, around belonging. And um, we have uh, some information to share with you. And then um, some of our students were able to join this evening, some that you know from previous board meetings and some new. Um, and so we're wanting to make some introductions tonight, and I know we're promoting those folks to panelists, um, probably as I speak. Uh, but as they're doing that, um, just where we've been so far, uh, we had a meeting in September via Zoom, uh, and we talked about the process as a whole with student advisory reps. Uh, we did some introductions, and we talked about our collective focus on belonging for the year and, and where that came from. Uh, and then just uh, uh, last week, we had our first in-person meeting at Fort Vancouver High School. Um, it was uh, awesome to be together. Uh, it started with a tour of Fort that the Fort students led, and not all of our students have a chance to be in each other's schools, so there was a lot of um, kind of cool opportunities to see just how other things are organized. Um, lots of relationship building as well, um, some shared uh, food and just kind of trying to get to know each other. Uh, and then the um, student advisory uh, led a process of just like what's working so far for them during the school year and what are ideas around improvements. Um, and so they started that brainstorming activity and in small groups and then they shared out as a large group. Uh, we are scheduled here in the beginning of November to have another Zoom meeting. Um, we will be looking at that data that they generated and some other data related to student belonging and the student experience. Uh, to start to develop that joint focus with the board and to maybe narrow down uh, into a project um, for this year. Uh, and then also they are a component of our strategic planning process. And so I'm going to uh, probably give them some information on the strategic planning um, uh, steps that we have for the course of the year and how they're involved in that. And then in December, um, we'll have an in-person meeting again, and this time at Skyview High School. Um, and we're thinking about doing kind of a similar format. Um, the you might see a theme here that we're going zoom and then in person zoom and then in person um, part of it is that um, just students busy schedules and trying to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to connect and so the meetings that are in person are taking place outside of the school day and the meetings that are zoom are taking place during the school day and so those students um, have access and um, we want to really build a, a large uh, a group that has gets to know each other and, and is able to contribute um, so that's kind of an overview. I think um, we have several students on here. And so let me just kind of 
stop my screen share and um, I see uh, Nora is on here. So Nora, do you wanna start with an introduction? And what we, what we ask students to do is um, their name, um, their grade and the school that they're from. And then also if they're interested or willing tonight to just kind of maybe share their why behind um, why they're choosing to do this work. It's a, it's a commitment that we're asking from them. So uh, Nora, are you okay to lead us off? Of course. My name is Nora Van Rees. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a senior at the Vancouver School of Arts and Academics this year, and I serve as the co-chair along with Clark for the Student Advisor Committee. And I think my why is to really advocate for student voice and make sure all perspectives are being heard and acknowledged in the district and helping kids feel like they belong. And I'll pass it off to Clark. Hello, I'm Clark Hegwald. I'm a senior at uh, Vancouver High Tech Preparatory this year, um, and I'm really excited to be here this year to help organize and to help bring the district closer together. That's my why of why I'm helping this out is community is something that's really important to me, and I think it's been so strong in Vancouver in the past, and I want to keep that going for Vancouver. Thanks, Clark. Um, how about Avery? I see you on here. Yes, hi, my name is Avery Hughes Davis. I am in grade 10 and I go to a Van Vancouver iTech Preparatory. And um, my re main reason for being on the Student Advisory Committee is I just really wanna try to help improve my school to make it the best experience possible for everybody that's going to it. So that's why, thank you. Thanks Avery. Um, it looks like we have Bodie Newhouse as well. Hello. My name is Bodie Newhouse. I am a junior at the Vancouver School of Arts and Academics, and I guess I just want to try to help make a positive change in our district. Thanks, Bodie. And I'm just scanning to make sure um, we ask students to kind of weigh in and um, put student in their tag just to make sure. And Jefferson, it looks like we don't have any others, right? Correct. Not that I'm spotting. Okay. And we let them know that this was the first opportunity and um, they're very excited to engage with you. We also talked about um, doing an in-person meeting once we kind of know what the project is gonna look like um, and um, interacting with the board um, that way as well. Um, if board directors are interested in attending one of the in-person meetings, just let us know. Um, we'd love to have you come and join us. Uh, and Clark and Nora ran the last one, you know, I was, I was just handing out napkins for the pizza. Uh, and so they did a really, really nice job. Um, Director Decker, I see that you have a question. Yeah, I was wondering, is Tessa, are you a student? No, <laughs> sorry. It's okay, no, I'm not a student. I'm a All right. <laughs> okay, well, uh, students, thanks for joining us this evening. We really appreciate your time. You're welcome to stay on um, uh, if you would like. And also, we recognize that you have a lot going on, too. So we'll see you on November 8th, um, if not sooner. Thank you guys for being here tonight. So that's our um, culture and climate report. And uh, I will move us then into the next part of the agenda this evening. And um, one of the, uh, you know, we are, are we set our district goals, um, board superintendent goals related to the equity policy. And we identified these themes uh, and student learning obviously is at the heart of everything that we do. Um, and in the policy, we set up that there would be uh, multiple times during the school year that the board would be presented with data. Um, sometimes that data would be more summative in nature, um, be it like graduation rates or smarter balanced assessment. And then other times that would be more formative in, in nature. Um, we also talked about that um, we would want to look at not just academic progress, but also um, student belonging and making sure that as we come out of the pandemic um, and recognizing that our students have experienced a lot over the last several years, how are they feeling in school, what's working for them, um, tell us about their experience. So tonight we have both sets of data uh, that we'll share with you. And then also just recognizing that this is new for us in our district. We haven't done this kind of um, you know, progress monitoring at this level at the, with the board. And so um, we are reorienting or reculturing kind of an entire district around this process. And our team that's gonna share tonight that Lindsay's gonna talk a little bit about are trying to build resources on the back end that really support um, 
teachers and principals to um, inform their decisions, inform their instructional moves um, based on what our students are demonstrating and needs that are arising, not just at an individual level, but across our system um, so that we can deploy resources and expertise to really help kids um, when they need it. Uh, so last time in our regular board meeting in person, we talked at a high level about smarter balanced assessments um, and looked at those and looked at the number of students that met versus didn't meet standard. Uh, and then we looked at just some comparisons across the state with smarter balanced and recognizing that smarter balanced is one assessment. It's an important assessment in our state, um, but there are other information um, um, assessments that can help us uh, determine where our students at and, and how we can support them. Uh, and so tonight we're going to kind of go a little deeper. So we've started at that um, more summative kind of process and now we're going to go into a formative way. And um, I'm going to turn it over to Lindsay Malam, um, uh, director of our um, DART team, and she's going to make some introductions. Uh, you already met Tessa a, a little bit, Sorry. but uh, she's, she's queued up, ready to go. Uh, and so, Lindsay, I'll turn it over to you and I'll drive the slides. Um, so just let me know when you want me to move them forward. Yeah, thanks so much. That was a great tee up. Um, I have the pleasure tonight of introducing our amazing uh, data team. Uh, Jeffrey Lucan couldn't join us tonight, but he's here in spirit. We do everything as a team. Um, and we have Tessa Stanger. She goes by Tess. Um, and she's going to talk a little bit about that sense of belonging and then dive a little deeper into the tools that we have created to help um, our stakeholders. And then we have Ann Pregler, and she's going to go um, into uh, taking those standards and utilizing them for future work. So without further ado, uh, Tess, take it away. Hello, everyone. Okay, so we are gonna talk about uh, two of the focus areas that we have this year um, with VPS and our students. Hey Tess, um, yeah. you're coming through pretty quietly. So I don't know if you can um, uh, adjust the microphone or something. Hmm. Is this better? It's a little bit, but still a little quiet. Oh no. Um... I could get closer to my computer. Maybe, yeah, thank you. Okay. Don't mind my big head, I guess. <laughs> okay, um, so, all right. Um, I was just gonna talk about two of our focuses we have here at VPS um, this year. One of our focus areas is the student experience and their sense of belonging. It's been shown that students who feel more a part of their community do well in school. Um, and we really wanted to focus in on that. Uh, utilizing Panorama is how we want to look at that. So Panorama is a tool that gives students the opportunity to self-answer um, questions about their self-beliefs, their emotions, their views on an experience within the climate and culture of their school. Uh, there is a set of questions within those two giant surveys that they get um, that specifically focus on the student's sense of belonging. Here we are looking at a uh, historical view of the third through fifth graders. Um, the third through fifth graders on Panorama get a um, different questions than the older kids, um, but they are generally around the same, just different wording. Uh, we have a looking at as far back as fall of 2021 to spring of 2022, and then fall of 2022 as well. Um, we can see that they were at about 66% favorable in their responses on the sense of belonging questions. It dipped down to 61% in last spring. And then this fall, we saw a jump back up to the 65% in the favorable uh, responses to the sense of belonging questions. For the 6th through 12th graders, we're looking at the exact same time frame of fall 2021 to spring 2022, and then again this fall of 2022. Um, and this actually, there, I mean, there was a little bit of a dip and a bounce back, but going from 39% to 38% to 40% generally is staying around the same percentage of favorable 
responses of those students to the sense of belonging questions. We are also going to be adding in this year, we're gonna be doing uh, winter testing as well on Panorama so that we do get that extra point in during the mid school year. All right, and then next up we're looking at um, another focus area for our school year and it's going to be the teaching experience and what the students need. To track this, we will be using priority standards to explain what those are, we have the overarching state standards acting as an umbrella. These standards are assessed within iReady where this data is actually coming from. And under that, we have essential standards and we have priority standards. The priority standards have been chosen through research because they address identified gaps within the district. Um, and uh, basically, uh, they show that where the most opportunities for growth are within our student learning. Shown here um, are the iReady results from our most recent fall assessment for the third graders. Uh, the 8.73% seen on this slide represents the standards that the students have mastered. With this being the fall data right at the beginning of the school year, we expect to see a low percentage point um, because the school year just started and um, we expect to see more of the have not met standard or insufficient data than met standards at this point in time. This is also showing only the math priority standards for that third grade level. There are other standards and other domains that do show up on this uh, tool um, just uh, when we're not filtered down to them. So you can see those otherwise. Um, the percentage tells us the percentage of students or the tested standards on students that were met within each domain. And then the bars below lay out each individual standard with a breakdown if the student met the standard, which is the blue bar, if the student did not meet the standard, which is the orange bar, and then if there is insufficient data, which is the gray bar. Hmm. And then some standards are broken down into smaller sections, um, which you can kind of see right at that. Actually, both of them do it. Um, so they're broken down because the assessment will show that a student may have met part of that standard, but not the whole standard. So they will break it down so that we can show um, that they have met it. So there is some blue on there. Um, yes, so over the school year, we will expect to see more blue and then the orange gets smaller. And we will also have this testing uh, for winter as well. So um, just having that other data point in there for the school year is just gonna give us that much more um, of a picture of where our students are at. Uh, this data dashboard is available for administrators. We are currently looking at ways to make this available for teachers though as well. And uh, with that, I'm going to hand it off to my colleague, Anne, who will explain how teachers can use this to enhance their instruction. Great, right, thank you. So here on this dashboard, you can see the standards, same standards you saw on the previous page, but now they're for just one individual student. The student's name has of course been hidden. Um, currently administrators and the future teachers will be able to see standards for each student um, or for classes as well as for the whole district or school. For right now, what we've been working on, go ahead and go to the next slide and you can see a picture of this. Um, this was rolled out this year for fall conferences. This is the student roadmap to success, and we're incorporating those priority standards you just saw by feeding them into an automated online process. So teachers, when they go to complete this, automatically have access to all of their students' progress, as well as demographics, state assessment levels, and other information about them, which they can then use to complete their own recommendations for what the student should do to keep succeeding. So for example, here you can see that on those ELA standards on the far left, the first standard has been partially met, the second standard has been met. This is following that exact same met, not yet met, and insufficient data that you saw on the dashboard. The only addition here is that partially met, 
which means that they have met some of those pieces of the standard that Tess was talking about, but haven't yet shown that they've met all of them. This is a tool that can be used for teachers to communicate with families about student learning. Um, so this page is printed and given to families and conferences. We had about 50% usage of this for the fall. If you go onto the back page, to the next, there we go. Um, you can see that the entire text of the standard is printed there for the families to start that dialogue between families and teachers about how students are progressing on stage. And go ahead and pass it back. All right, thank you so much, uh, team, for presenting. We are very excited about the tools that have been developed um, by these lovely ladies, and Jeffrey included in that. Um, we are also excited that the work that we get to do aligns to that overall district goal and incorporates more stakeholders. So we anticipate that the next time that we do this progress monitoring, we will have some of those stakeholders with us to give you a picture of their experience and how they're utilizing this data. So with that, I will pass it back um, to Dr. Snell. Thank you, Lindsay and team. I think um, we would love to just kind of hear from um, board directors, uh, any questions that you might have. I know that, you know, the board has also had an opportunity to meet either individually or a couple at a time with um, Lindsay and team to kind of help drive um, some of the data that you would like to see. Um, I think in the winter, it's our, the presentation is going to look a little different because we'll have two points in time with the data as opposed to this first um, point in time. So today we concentrated a little more on the tools um, and next time maybe looking more along um, the lines of what's happening with students and how are we um, responding based on the data. Um, but I'll, I'll pause and see if there's any um, director comments or questions um, for the team. Yeah, I think that was uh, what I was most interested in seeing is just really how it's going to be used, which you talked about, you know, like the, the teachers can pull that for fall conferences, but um, I think being able to hear um, from like teachers and or administrators on, you know, how it's working, because I think that to me is, uh, you know, we have this great system set up, but I want to make sure that it's you know, providing useful information um, and just seeing too, like how how they're using it to inform instruction and kind of make progress. Cause we have, you know, we have this data but then being able to use it to um, improve and kind of inform what we're doing, I think is, uh, is what I'm looking forward to in the future. And um, I just have a question about uh, translations. Are we up? on being able to provide that data in the native translation, the native uh, language? Yes, so currently um, the student roadmaps for fall were available in Spanish and English, including full translations for Spanish. Uh, we are hoping for the next round, we will have Russian and Shokis also available. And those roadmaps will be uploaded to Family Access in Spanish, Russian, and Shokis. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I have a couple questions, but first is thank you for the presentation. Um, I love all the work that you've done and that you that the board has had access um, that we've never had before to the data. Um, I personally very much enjoyed um, looking all at the work that you've done over the last several months. Um, I think you guys just showed us how the roadmap um, and the standards by how it will impact the teacher and maybe that conversation with families around standards for the individual student. But maybe if you could talk a little bit about when you look at maybe a class or at the building level or even like macro at the district level, you know, what those trends are and how that might inform instructional practices. 
Well, that's a great question. Um, we are going to dive into those trends. Right now, we just got access to the data. So um, we look forward to doing that work and sharing those um, with you. Um, what I can tell you is we do have a, a page within that workbook that we didn't include in the presentation that does go to a class level. So you have several student names on one side. And then you can actually look across and see those X's or checks or diamonds. And so it makes it really easy for a building administrator or a teacher to see like, oh, I've got a gap here on this particular standard. So I really need to focus. Another way that they might want to apply this is looking at students that are struggling with similar standards and grouping them together to really focus in on mastery of those skills. Um, so I hope that answers your question and, and we look forward to talking about it further. No, absolutely. I think it just, um, I know I've had some conversations with your team. Just, I think it's really exciting work to see how the data is going to be informing some of those, um, some of that analysis and you've mentioned school improvement plans, et cetera, going forward. So thank you. And I was just going to add on the school improvement plan front, Director Sproul, that that is exactly, um, you know, Lindsay's team and Lindsay are going out with the principal supervisors to meet with the principals and to listen into um, what is the problem of practice at the building level related to the school improvement plan and why, and then using that conversation to inform how to build the dashboard. And so when principals are identifying uh, priority focus groups of students for whatever reason, then in the dashboard, they're able to load the group of students in so that they can monitor the progress over time uh, with that group. Um, we haven't had that capability before. And so we have identified priority focus as part of our school improvement plan, but then we've just been relying on like these um, uh, um, summative assessments like Smarter Balance to say, did that actually affect that? You know, We're not 100% sure. Um, the other piece that I would add is that you know, Smarter Balance is, of course, one major, iReady is a major, but you also might have noted that um, there were some other teacher assessed um, places in the thing. And so we want to continue to build that part out through the PLC process. And uh, you previously had an update on the PLC work from um, Jim Gray and Carrie Van Ostren, and that's a key component of this, too, because um, iReady is a major, but we also want um, uh, assessments developed by our teachers that help inform this work. And so in the end, that roadmap will be informed by a portfolio of assessments that are um, allowing teachers to share how students are demonstrating proficiency, um, and then also to identify why, why aren't they in certain areas and what can we do about that. Thank you. I had one other question about the roadmap. Um, I think it's a great new tool just because it really identifies on a, you know, for, for families where their students have opportunities for growth and exactly where they are. Um, I know this is very newly rolled out and conferences were just um, last week and, you know, it, it is a shift in how we're doing things. What, Besides the teacher to family, what is the communication support around this new tool? Because, you know, personally, I am a parent that went through conferences and it looked differently, but I knew what to expect. You know, how are we supporting kind of the evolution for parents in terms of supporting their students learning? Yeah, that's an excellent question, too. And I think one that we will acknowledge that we have um, opportunities to grow in that as it's new. Um, part of that is the key is to go back to that PLC work and the partnership around like what are what are school um, teams and uh, grade level teams or content teams, how are they using the data, how can we make sure that the dashboard is really um, functional for them so that then the tools are being used. Um, you know, all this amazing design on the back end, the reason they do it is because they want it used, right? They don't want it just to be for board presentations, they want it to affect outcomes for kids. And we have staff at varying levels of um, expertise with that and comfort. And so we wanna support them. And we also, I think it's a big deal that at a board level, you're looking at this data and we're saying this is important for our system. Um, because sometimes individually teachers will have great processes to determine uh, proficiency, but it's hard for us to get around 21,000 individual processes 
um, in order to deploy resources and prioritize things to help um, all those students. And so it is a bit of a growing, um, I guess, uh, just process um, to kind of reculture our district around like, this is what we do in the fall. We look at the first round uh, and then we start to make decisions in preparation for the second round so that we know what to expect when kids are getting to the end of the year and helping them transition to whatever's next, be it third grade to fourth grade or senior to graduation, right? Um, and so it will take some time and um, we need to listen to our staff and what's working for them and what's not working for them and, and try to um, uh, re reply accordingly. The one piece that we also are trying to be careful with is if you've ever explored data and you're really excited about that, usually it leads to more questions right away. And so we're trying to also support the team in saying, great question, but that's something that we can't just update every day on the fly. Like we need to understand collectively, how do we deploy these resources? Otherwise, you know, Tess and Anne are gonna be every day chasing more data, right? Um, and so, especially when it's new in our process. Um, so hopefully in a year or two, when we have that foundation established, then it's much more easy to respond real time. One more uh, quick comment. Um, the, the roadmap to success is, I think, so key to empowering parents to work with their student with their child and the school to help their child succeed it's so hard you know we come at it as educators and we kind of know like okay these are the next steps for this this child and these are the next steps for that child but um parents sometimes don't necessarily know how to help them be more successful and to have those very specific and detailed standards that they know what to work on especially our some of our parents who you know work long hours and you know have just a little bit of time to do that it's just terrific they'll they'll be able to like squeeze that in and let's do you know time you know two digit multiplication with this factor in it so it's wonderful so i'm very excited i think just to piggyback on that and in relation to my last question, I mean, this is an evolving work and I'm so grateful for it. I, obviously everyone on the board has heard me talk about data, but I, I love that we've anchored in um, just this data analysis, but I think the tools we're offering to parents, if there's, as we refine the process, if there's an opportunity for almost a, a video communication to families around just helping parents understand how to use it um, to support their student. I think that could be a fun opportunity. Um, you know, I think our communications can be um, pretty dynamic and, and engage our families in supporting student learning. Well, if there aren't any more questions, we'll say thank you to Lindsay and Ann and Tess and thanks to Jeff, uh, Jeffrey, who uh, helped prepare as well. And then I will start sharing my screen again. And I'll invite um, Christy and Lucy to share a little about our multilingual learning and um, just to look at the current programming in place and, and potentially some opportunities ahead. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, everyone. All right, Lucy, you wanna take it away? Yes, um, I'm really happy to be here, first of all, and thank you for giving us the opportunity to talk about something that's just, um, you know, a passion of both Christine and myself. So thank you so much. And all of you, of course, too. Um, just a little overview of what uh, the state of multilingual um, education or the department is here in VPS right now. Uh, we have about uh, 378 multilingual students in Vancouver Public Schools. Um, it will fluctuate up and down per day, but it's 344 more students than we had last year. And we have approximately 310 uh, students that have recently arrived. And um, that's really a combination of the uh, beginning of the school year and a little bit of the end of last year as well. Uh, recently arrived students are about counted about six months in um, the country. So 
And some of the things that we're working on, a little bit of the philosophy is really um, changing the practice of how we speak about our newcomers. And we really um, want to change that terminology into more of a recently arrived students. We want to honor, you know, um, their language and the literacy and the culture and just that positive mindset that all our students come with something to offer us here. Um, and, um, and we just want to honor that a little bit. We do have a couple of things that we're working on. Um, next year, for example, all of the middle school students will receive, receive support and services in their home schools. And that's just based on a a number of situations and things that we feel that will be um, more beneficial for them and um, one including busing, right? Um, a couple more trends. Most of our students are coming from Central America, Ukraine and Afghanistan right now. And um, I don't know if you've heard through the uh, Lutheran Family Services that we still continue to be a refugee settlement city. So we will be continuing to get more students um, in the year to come. The top languages in um, BPS right now are Spanish. We have about 3,411. Russian, about 500. And then Chukis, approximately 333. Um, if you combine uh, all of the languages uh, from the second to the 10th, um, they're about 29%. So um, that just gives you a kind of a vision of where our numbers are. And um, we have a link and I, I invite you to go and view this. This is from OSPI because this is kind of the foundation of our work and of meeting the civil rights obligation that we have to. And it's based on two components. One is giving kids meaningful access to their content and really it's their grade level content. And then the second one is providing English language development to them. Uh, next slide. So um, one of the uh, ways that we're hoping that we impact change in student achievement is um, what we're uh, going through, uh, the coaching and the co-teaching model. It's important because um, we really want to look at the way teachers um, operate in their building and what has been working and what just needs tweaking. Um, we have about 29.5 teachers for 3,000 students. And so that's a ratio of 118 to one. And that's really due to the way Washington State, State funds um, our department or multi the multilingual department. Um, it's like we are the very top of the pyramid, uh, this um, supplementary services. So they fund it at a rate that, um, that accommodates 29.5 uh, teachers. For our program. And through that, though, we want to really look at the coaching model because that will impact the way we um, can be able to meet more of uh, the needs of our kids and help the teachers um, impact their instruction as well. So that, um, that does include some of the training that they've had and um, some of the training that we want to give them. And it's the model that the research shows that it is um, greatly impacts the support for our, our students. Next, please. So we have opportunities. I know we hear in the news um, how, um, you know, our students have been uh, impacted by the pandemic and the latest results on math and reading scores in fourth grade and so forth. So we, we realize that we have opportunities to better serve our students. We have what we call long-term ELs. And the goal really is to have our students exit by fifth grade. Unfortunately, we do have about 1,367, we call them LTELs in Vancouver. And so um, in looking at the data, it's really interesting to try to figure out um, how many have dropped out, how many have moved out of the system. Um, and that's what we're really working with actually Lindsay's team to try to figure that out because kids drop out and we don't know where they end up, right? Um, after uh, they, once they become an LTEL, the research really states that it's really difficult for them to graduate. So we have, uh, we have a, big, um, a big issue and a big opportunity to try to help them. Um, 
and we want to really improve our supports because we have about 17% of our um, multilingual students are um, identified, dual identified in special ed and, uh, and EL. And so um, we are really working hard in the collaboration with um, the SPED department, especially right now we're working with our school psychologists and we've started just reviewing our um, critical data review process and how we can best um, help them help parents while they're introducing um, and having their IEP meetings and who really should be referred to uh, special ed and who just needs extra language development support. And we really are working together and trying to see that every student um, is individual and um, every student has different language needs. Next one. So, we are working on uh, continuing our opportunities. We had our intake center and um, in August, we had over a thousand people enter a two week period um, and ask for supports. We enrolled students for registration and um, we were able to administer over 90 um, WIDA assessments. And those are the ones that uh, help students qualify for our program. So um, we've, Right, we're regist we registered over 300 students and um, we feel that it was a success. Um, that piece about giving parents that wraparound support uh, was really um, important at that, at that time. And again, uh, the middle school program is something that we continue to work on um, and that expansion of dual language in the middle school as well. One of the things that we're looking at is really trying to evaluate what each school has in terms of curriculum. Um, and some curriculum is um, is needing just to uh, to be reviewed as um, we may need to look into something different. And that's where the co-teaching model will come in again, helping teachers evaluate what they have in their classroom and what they can do with their students inside their classroom that may not need extra curriculum, just extra help and um, planning with a teacher and a lead. We are piling something that is called Lexia English, and that is for our new our new arrivals and our level one, um, I'm sorry, recent arrivals and our level one students. And really we're, uh, that's that oral language development that they really need as they first come in. And um, it just varies from a student need and student by student on how long they need that oral language development. Next, I think is uh, you, Christy, right? I guess so, Lucy. Yeah. So um, you can see that we were trying to think really big picture about what, what have we done in the past to support this group of student learners and their families? What wins have we had in doing that? Where do we need to improve practice and understand better what kids and families need? And then what teachers need to support them? So trying to figure out with a pretty limited funding model, what's a good way to increase our academic output, honor the um, all of the gifts and strengths that they bring to us as members of our community and how to foster their belonging and feeling like they, they are part of their new community and that they get their needs met. So we wanna stop over identifying them for being in need of something like lab services or an IEP when really maybe they just need practice with the language. So how do we best understand that? Um, that would fit with our equity work, it would fit with the law, um, and it would fit with the state's preferred model. So that brings us to like, how do we, how do we increase opportunities for this group of students since they are coming to us in bigger and bigger numbers? What would that look like? And you've heard us before in our beating our dual language drum. So here we are again. We want to make sure that part of the, the best part, the most, um, I guess the most logical and exciting part to us is being able to not worry that we don't have enough teachers to serve this group of population, this group of students, but to say, actually, we do know how to serve them. And we want to do it in a dual language model where these children can showcase the strengths that they bring both culturally and linguistically. Um, they can bring their whatever literacy they come with in their home language to bear. 
And their English speaking counterparts would benefit from that in understanding what, what these gifts are, learning another language, while our EL students are acquiring English. Um, and, and it kind of flips the paradigm of, of an English language learner always needing something from us because somehow they're deficient in, in what they bring to the table. This puts them in a position of, no, actually it's my language that's driving the cart here and I get to be a leader in the class and I get to be a teacher. So it's, it's an exciting thing for us as we think about um, implementing our equity policy. So we've talked a little bit before about how we're going to expand and we have this opportunity with RBG. And so we wanted to present to you some of our thinking around how might we go about this expansion of dual language opportunities. And we see it in two different possibilities, basically to open up Ruth Bader Ginsburg as a whole dual language school, probably concentrating to start either with kindergarten and first grade or if we were feeling really lucky and we could get all the staff in the world that we needed, maybe even offering um, preschool just to kind of bulk up the, the school population and, and get a, a good trajectory going through. And we also would like to add in Fruit Valley because it's a tiny school and it already has the population. It would only be one class for us and we could start growing the program there in an area of high need. So that's op option one, one full school, one tiny program. If we can't do the whole school, then we would look at where do we have the population of Spanish speaking students already living in what schools would benefit from offering dual language as a strand program. And we would be growing those similar to how we've done with Roosevelt and King that have been added on recently. And we would then need to talk about, do we do just kindergarten or we do kindergarten and first, like how, how would that look? But those are the two ways that we see in our nearest future, what that might look like. Um, so we began to talk with HR, we began to talk with operations and transportation. How do we recruit? How do we get, you know, what, what would all this look like? What are some of the details? So if you go to the next page, we'll tell you a little bit about our why, why we're so excited about this opportunity. Um, I mentioned it before, but really prioritizing the needs of our dual language learners, particularly Latinx students and families. Whereas I know we're working to examine our process for schools of choice and how not to keep privileging the same group of people over and over again. We see this as an opportunity to privilege a group that is generally underrepresented in our district and not always recognized for the strengths that they bring. So primarily prioritizing the needs of Spanish speaking families and students. Um, there are several reasons why we'd like it to be a whole school opportunity. And again, we're still waiting for the demographer's report. We were hoping we'd get it today, just in the nick of time to share with you, but it, it's still out there. So, um, but part of the reason for doing a whole school model, one is that you have an opportunity to add a whole bunch of school of students all at once and a whole bunch of staff all at once. So you would have the synergy of it's new, it's super focused, it has the same goal, uh, as a school community. And we're not trying to add on a program to an existing school community and ensure a good fit and see where they, um, how they line up with the English only instructional track. We believe this opportunity highlights the work of our equity policy and allows us to kind of put a flag in the ground about what we believe about dual language and how we believe we best serve our students. Both Lucy and I have been uh, dual language principles. And I, I think a lot about how much I would have loved this opportunity to really focus with my staff around professional learning that's specific and only about dual language instruction so that we get really good at it. I wouldn't have to divide my thinking when I, when I create professional learning for my staff. I don't have to think about what the English side of the house is doing versus the dual language side of the house. I don't have to figure out how the PLCs will work together. I don't have to like I don't have to make all those extra accommodations because we have a singular focus because we're a dual language school and everybody that's there is there because they believe in that. They believe in that as a way for kids to be honored in what they bring to school and also to become bilingual, bilingual biliterate, bicultural. Um, the concentration would include that the staff would be bilingual, that again, our professional learning, instructional practices, our goal setting, everything would be identified around the tenets of dual language education. 
and we would reduce the, the conflict and the competition for time, for resources, for how, how do you make it all go when you're really running two different programs under one roof. Um, we think that RBG is really well situated to be the, the home of this program because of its geographic situation in Vancouver and the kids that live around there. We also think it's an opportunity for us to make ourselves competitive and distinguish ourselves in Washington as the place to be, and even to pull people out of different Portland districts because it would be sort of a flagship, super cool opportunity for people to come and really dig in deep to what they believe about why dual language works for kids and be a chance to replicate what the research shows in a, in a best program model. So. That's our thinking and we're really hoping that the demography proves us right, that we would be thinking that, yes, there are enough kids that live in the area, there's enough interest. We are a little anxious to kind of have a decision and, and get started because we know we need to do some community outreach and some, we'd probably pop up an advisory committee like we're doing with the HICAP to hear what, what the community thinks and what would be needed in order to to build understanding about why we would be looking at this kind of programming. So we just dumped a whole lot of information in your lap. So I'm wondering what you're thinking. Christy, can you um, expand on, uh, you talked about in, in this kind of model of RBG being a dual language school, um, you said, you know, starting with either K and one or pre-K through first, um, so essentially under that model, like it would only open and those would be the only grades in the school to start with. Is that kind of what that would look like? I think so. When you, usually when you open either, well, it's usually my, I know about opening programs and usually go with one grade, but it's often, um, seen as very doable to do K and one together and kind of treat them in terms of their language development along a, a similar continuum. Just thinking that if we only opened with kindergarten, that's kind of a slow roll and could we get yeah. a little faster? Well, I wasn't sure, does that, so we have existing programs like at Anderson and Harney. So would that, would those programs stay, those K to five programs stay there? We would just be opening new or we're like, would those, would those programs get like meshed into RBG? Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I, we would like those programs to stay um, where they are. They're well established. Um, we would want to, you know, bring RBG into the fold of what we're already doing. And then, you know, we, there's opportunities to use it as a lab school to showcase like, you know, what, what best practices look like. We don't want to take away from what people are already doing. We want to be additive. I think there's an opportunity to look at through the demography report um, is there an opportunity to alleviate some of the crowding in Anderson by having some of that boundary shift over to RBG, but it wouldn't take away from Anderson's programming. It would just be about, you know, how do we right size Anderson so they don't have, you know, pickups that are, you know, 700 cars down the street, that kind of thing. Okay, I, ha I have other questions, but, uh, or those are my clarifying questions. I have some other kind of bigger thoughts, but I'll let others jump in if they have like clarification questions or thoughts. I, I think just, um, you just touched on relieving some of the overcrowding in Anderson, but, <clears throat> excuse me, in order to um, kind of attract families to a dual language school, I love the idea. Um, are we thinking that the boundary would be somewhat fluid in that general geography. And so then we're, I mean, cause we have several programs on the South end already. So this would be an opportunity for North end families to participate with transportation in the general vicinity, but it's not necessarily a fixed boundary. So the way we've been talking about it is sort of similar to how we've been talking about Vita where you'd have your set boundary, right? And then you'd have a priority boundary that would expand beyond so that we could fill the program and potentially alleviate some of the overcrowding and the other schools that are nearby. Um, and 
And then we'd have to figure out like, if you're not in that priority boundary and you're trying to get in, then we can like, we can't provide transportation for everybody, but we would have a, you know, somewhat of a priority boundary that we would say we, I mean, that's, that's the initial talking. I think there's a lot of talking to be done about how that works. Well, I guess my, my question is, I, I wholeheartedly support dual language. I think it's an amazing opportunity for our learners, both multi-language learners and our um, native English speaking learners. But um, if a family were drawn into the RBG boundary, but did not, for instance, want to participate in dual language, would there be flexibility that included transportation? I think that's something we would have to say is this, you know, you're in the boundary, but it is a dual language school. And if you don't want that, first, let us try and convince you why it would be fabulous yeah. for you. If you really don't want that, um, then could we have a reciprocal understanding with Walnut Grove or Anderson or somebody that was close enough where, again, this priority boundary would allow for some flexibility in, in how people attend school? And I mean, again, I, I, I fully support this model and this growth. And I think there's so much opportunity to really leverage future dual language expansion by having a flagship school like this. I just want to make sure that um, we offer flexibility to families. Yeah, we would need to, I think. You can't force people into a program that they don't have any investment in. Um, I have, uh, to go back to Fruit Valley, just real quick, I have a couple little. So are you thinking, because it is a very tiny school, are we thinking that that would eventually also become a full dual language class program? Because it that one totally makes sense to me. Um, not that RBG doesn't, but that, that community, um, I don't even remember what the percentage of, of, of uh, Latin, you know, Spanish speaking families are. Lucy, do you, or Christy, do you know offhand what the percentage is those, at that school? I don't, do you? I don't know offhand. I used to, but I'm. Just yeah, I know. <laughs> I can find it though. Um, <laughs> my, and my, my, my question around this is that because it is so small and they have like a class and a half per grade, when you look at putting, you know, one class of kinder, well, that's like their class of kinder, or it might be one of their two. And then when you move up to second grade, so I'm, I'm just trying to work out what the logistics would be like for that very tiny school. No, you're right. I mean, that was part of our thinking was actually, if we take it to Fruit Valley by default, eventually it's going to become a dual language school. I don't know that they would have enough kids to support two, two tracks, one English, one Spanish. Um, and, you know, maybe that's not a terrible thing because we, the community can support it. And um, in talking with Matt, the principal there, he was super excited. <laughs> so, yes, yeah. so, you know, I, I think it would be great to be a district where we could have different kinds of programming at different schools, depending on what the community needs and wants. And so that we're responding in, in the best possible way to, to meet the needs of the kids that live there. And then um, no, uh, two more questions. When we were back at just talking about multilingual, not necessarily dual language, and you were talking about co-teaching. And um, so are you looking at more of a push-in type of program where they, you know, the kids wouldn't be removed from their classroom for a half an hour and then brought back. It would be more of a push-in with some modification depending on what the kids needed. Is that yeah. how I'm understanding it? The least effective model is pull up. So, and we, as we look through our panorama data, kids want that sense of belonging and kids that are pulled up consistently um, from their classroom and children that have, um, you know, they, uh, I tell everybody they come with so many stories, try, uh, walking for three months to try to get here or just being uh, pulled from their home um, from the next day, those transitions are really difficult for them. And um, the model is that we want kids in the classroom as much as possible. We need to empower teachers and we need to sh um, help them and um, give them the professional development and what better way from a coach in their building that they trust right. an expert. And then one last question 
for now. <laughs> you know, I always have questions that creep up. Um, so you said that 17% of our EL population is like dual identified as both EL and um, special education. I'm just curious as to what's the percentage of our non language learners, our non EL students that are identified as as special ed. I can go on the OSPI website and look for right. that. What I can tell you is that it is over what we should be. We were looking at around 10% of our population should be um, just like everyone else, everyone else. And so um, it is, it's over. But okay. I, um, I was just curious. Um, and, uh, and it gives me just a little red flag about, because you um, as a teacher, sometimes you would get pushback on, I think this child needs more than what we're giving him or her. And I'd like to have, you know, them evaluated, or I'd like to have them look. And then um, I know I got pushback on, well, we need to go through, you know, the EL process. And I'm like, well, while we're going through that, can't we also look into this? Because we all know the earlier we intervene with an issue, the more success we have. So I just want us to make sure, I want us to not over-identify, but I also want us not to under-identify when we could be helping a kindergartner or helping a first grader with something um, that's more than just a you know, language involved. Yeah, and that's kind of getting at, at part of the, the crux that I think districts everywhere struggle with is what is our process for delineating what's a language right. issue and what's a learning issue? Because um, sometimes it's one and the same, um, and sometimes it's really separate. So how do we get confident in knowing what a kid needs? And I, I think that's what we're trying to figure out. Better. And I think it's, I, I don't think on, and you guys know more about the, the language um, research out there, but I think that the research is still kind of, you know, it, it's all about neuroscience and how your brain is processing and um, are we, f are, are we even able to delineate that at, you know, such a young age and, um, you know, just trying to figure it out so that every kid gets what they need. Does that make sense? Yeah. And some of the work that we are actually doing is with our school psychologists right now and just, um, uh, coming back and looking at that, uh, critical data review process so that we can, um, uh, work together, it, it, it can't just be our department, it can't be just the school psychology, right. we have to work together and collaborate um, because this is a topic that is, that requires a lot of uh, yes. working, looking, thinking. And if we identify students incorrectly, we know that the chances and the probability of them not graduating is, um, we've already, we know the data and the research. Right. Right. Yeah, both ends. Pulled out again and again for. Oh yeah, that's yeah. why the inclusive model that Tracy is, you know, part of that team, um, is so important because we can support them in multiple ways within their classroom. So, and I don't mean to delve into the weeds. I'm sorry, I sometimes go there, but I just that percentage kind of is like I wonder how that compares. But thank you, ladies. I'll give that to you. I don't want to switch topics from RBG and Fruit Valley, but I had a couple of questions on the middle school. So I'll pause if anyone else. I actually have a couple of questions about RBG. Um, and I apologize. I'm keeping my camera off because I'm having Wi-Fi issues. So hopefully you can hear me and I'm not cutting out. Um, <laughs> um, I, I, first of all, you answered a lot of the questions in your presentation that I had in your presentation. So thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions just in terms of like staffing and demand, but most of my questions are centered around the demographer's report. And Christy, I know you said you're hoping to get it, but we haven't gotten it. Do we know when we'll get it? We think the end of the week. It was supposed to be today, now it's the end of the week. And um, Jeff, is that, you have anything more clear? No. 
Okay. Um, I'm anticipating a lot of my questions would be answered with that one report. So Me I too. look forward to <laughs> um to getting it. Um my other question, right? My the question that you might be able to answer for me though, um, is just around demand because this RBG is so close to Anderson. Um do we I mean, do we have say waiting lists at Anderson? Are we seeing a need that is being un, unfilled at Anderson? Because that would give us a clue to like what the neighborhood is support like able to support. Yes, and we can say no in, in both. We do have a need that we want to, um, to um, fill because we have all our multilingual learners uh, that are not part of Anderson and that are in that priority area that could really benefit from the model that is um, that OSPI states is the best model for them to, to close the academic gap. We have seen a little dip like everybody else in terms of, um, of attendance. Um, but now that we are you know, starting and running up again, we are seeing that our dual language classrooms for the most part are the ones that are full and that are filling up quicker than our English classrooms. Part of the consideration too, Wendy, is that we, we intentionally didn't go out and do any advertising or marketing to get more kids in because we weren't at a place where we, we could grow this year. But next year, that's a big part of our plan is a lot of parent education, essentially a marketing plan for why dual language would work for your kid, not just for Spanish speaking kids, but for you know Vietnamese speaking kids, for African American kids, like for all different kinds of kids, like this is an opportunity for a lot of people and mostly what we see are Spanish speaking kids and white English speaking kids. How do we broaden that to really benefit a wider slice of our community? So that's part of what we want to um, get out there in the community. And part of why we would be looking at some advisory groupings to help us understand what, what need for information do parents have? Yeah. Um, I'm also super intrigued by the idea of adding preschool there. Do we have any dual language preschool classrooms? That would be, yeah. be amazing. <laughs> we are trying to think. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, uh, we are trying to. Uh, that's a goal. Would it be that's funded? All, oh, sorry, Wendy. No, I was just gonna say that's all the questions I have until I until we can see what the demographer says. But thank you guys very much. Well, in part before you go, Kathy, just that the preschool was really just our noodling on how could we get lots of kids in there so that we show that that RBG has a has a purpose. I don't think over time we would be able to sustain a, a pre-K through five. It's not that big of a school, but it would get us started and it would help us develop. What, what does a dual language preschool look like that we could, could we do one class in all the other schools? I don't, you know, there's a lot of unknowns, but that was just an idea. Well, I guess um, it would probably, for the funding purposes, it would probably need to tie in like the current, um, uh, programs that are being offered at Ogden and King, the it's current three schools, and, but adding that dual language piece, you know, so that's the Title I and the special ed funding together, along with you. Know, the gen ed teacher could be a dual language teacher, mm -hmm. and finding a <laughs> talk about finding a niche of a teacher. A special education teacher that's native language is Spanish too, but I'm sure they're out there. We have one in the, a student teacher in our district just like that. So, and I have some uh, good friends and colleagues that are still in Portland that have their ear to the ground for what RBG might be like, and many of them are special educators who are bilingual, bicultural. So, um, that would be it, yeah, it's fun to think about, right? Yeah. <laughs> If it's not for that silly thing called funding, yes, indeed. I think it's really exciting just the, the idea that you we would leverage like the space, this brand new state-of-the-art facility to kind of as a proof of concept for both a dual language like lab for professional development, but also how to really get into the space of early childhood education for dual language to support our dual language students. Um, I think it's just, it's very forward thinking, I think, and be, it's mindful of kind of who are, who are, 
even though we don't have the demographers report, who our community is really made up of. Um, and, and can we leverage that? I don't know if you caught that. We're trying to get into teachers' minds that, that ELs or multilingual kids really need to exit the EL program by fifth grade. Otherwise, they're sort of consigned to a life of less than because they don't have as many elective opportunities. They, they don't, they don't, they don't. That's, that's not what we want. So could we, could dual language impact that? Could, could the structure of dual language itself jolt them out of that, that system and really provide something better? So it is, it, it, it is exciting, definitely. So that kind of feeds into my question, um, just about the, the data about the multilingual students we're welcoming into our district. Um, and is there space in our, I, I'm very appreciative that we're expanding kind of, we're broadening our K-5, but also scaling up in through middle school. Um, but is there an opportunity to welcome our, our recently arrived students into our middle school dual language offering? I know that historically you kind of, you're, you're in Harney or Anderson, and then you get to go to Geyser and Mac. But is there an opportunity to make those middle school offerings inclusive of our newly arrived students? Or maybe are we already doing that? We actually started that last year. And so what we've what the latest research research states is that dual language for is uh, should be available for any student K-12. And um, so what we've been doing uh, to bolster those classes up in um, we started with sixth grade. Uh, we tested the students just to see their um, the proficiency level in Spanish. Some of the teachers really felt that we sh should do that. So we did that. We went out and did that. We contacted the parents as well. And we said, we have this offering for you. And honestly, we had only one family decline out of, I think it was 70 something. Um, Elsa has the, the um, exact number because she did most of the testing with a small team. And we had parents say, why, you know, they, we had parents cry and um, say, we really were looking for something like this to help us because as they get older, um, the level of English attainment for the student, the verbal, the social is, um, is climbing while the parents are um, staying at the same level for the most part. And so that communication barrier starts happening. And so they're saying we can't communicate with our kids and they're 11, they're 12. We can't communicate with their grandparents. And um, it was a, it was actually a really great experience. That's amazing. Thank you. Yeah. And it, it's also, it's educating our current staff also on, on why we would do this and what the benefits are, because there had been some thinking around now it's English now, you know, and so kind of a re-educating of why we would do this and, and, and how it helps. And then some of the similar thinking about why we're not looking to continue all of middle school newcomers go to Mac. We want them in their communities. We want them to feel like they can walk down the street and go to their neighborhood middle school like all the other kids and not get bussed across town. So how do we leverage what they're bringing to us and really celebrate who they are and ensure that they feel at home in their neighborhood schools? Would, would you, oh. Oh, did you have a follow up on well, that? I just, I, I just, I guess, would the ultimate vision be then that at the middle school space and welcoming our recently arrived multilingual, that there would be some sort of more of a dual language approach in all of the middle schools? If, I mean, and I guess high school, if, if that's best practice K-12, is that there would be an opportunity for kids to have that dual language experience? Well, we expanded at Geyser and at Mac. Um, we haven't thought about that. No, I mean, and that's, I, I'm more thinking like long-term vision if, if it's really about kind of celebrating what they're offering. I don't know. It's yeah. exciting to think about. It is. So I guess my kind of question slash not necessarily concern, but just kind of what's rolling around in my head as we've been talking about this. So Christy, like you were just talking about um, wanting students to feel kind of that they belong, you know, in their neighborhood school, in their community. Um, 
100% I support expanding dual language programming. I feel like, I mean, I know from, from being an educator myself that, you know, that is um, one of the best um, methods for, um, you know, services for students who are multilingual learners. Um, I guess my, my thought kind of as we're talking about other types of services and supports for students and how can we expand them out into neighborhood schools and communities in terms of, like you mentioned, like the newcomers program, when we look at it through like a special education lens, through, um, you know, like highly capable services, through all sorts of like services and programming that we can offer students, kind of that, that trend that we've been talking about is providing those supports where students are. Mm -hmm. um, so when I think about when I think about that, I guess I go kind of back and forth in terms of I love the idea of of expanding and having kind of this, you know, school that really is focusing on this, but I also there's another part of me that thinks would it be better to expand dual language programming in more elementary schools rather than having like one school that has a whole lot. Does that make sense? I just, yes. I, I go back yeah. and forth between like if we had dual language at like five mm -hmm. elementary schools, um, you know, with the thought of like eventually like every, every elementary school would have a dual language program or, you know, something like that. Well, you're, you're helping me identify a missing slide, um, oh, which okay. would be like we're thinking about RBG for next year, but then there's a the year after that where we would go back to doing the program by program, you know, around the district. So we would do all of it. Um, it wouldn't just be get RBG off the ground and stop there. It would be can we focus next year on RBG in Fruit Valley? The following year would be the other four or five schools that we've already identified that have a large Latino population. We'd like to get those up and running as well. Okay. So, that makes me feel a little better because I was just picturing like RBG being like this hub of dual language, which is great. But then it's like if you live, you know, whatever school it's like and you want dual language for your child because, you know, Spanish is their primary language, like you have to go somewhere else. Right versus being at your neighborhood school. So that'll have to be part of our marketing plan to make sure that people know, like even if you don't take advantage of this particular opportunity next year, that don't worry, we're coming to you too. Yeah. <laughs> I love that, Christy. Soon, coming to you. And I also want to just clarify for people that might be watching that don't know a lot behind the science and the outcomes that um, dual language provides. It's also about the native English speakers in the program. And um, as um, Dirk Sprawl will say, the, um, the outcomes, the data is just amazing at um, how much, how do I wanna say this? It's just amazing at the learning curve of both sets of students in this program, not just, it's not just about serving the multilingual learners. It's about creating multilingual learners and serving both of those. And um, their test scores far exceed every other set of test scores um, in uh, any other program. It's and not the testing is everything, but it's the thing that people come back to. So um, we've been talking a lot about multilingual learners, and I just want to make clear that it's also about serving those, um, those people that aren't multilingual yet and creating multilingual learners in our schools. Thank you. That's a, a good point. And really what we want is to prepare all of our students for life outside of K-12 education. You know, how do they participate in a global economy, a global society where most of the rest of the world does already speak more than one language and we don't compete very well. So how do we provide that for all of our kids? Yeah, and aside from looking at Thomas and Collier who are the gurus, there is a research from um, Mario Ferron and he really looks at um, all the groups 
and their high school education rates and how they graduate and the exams they take. And, um, and um, it's really geared more towards the high school lens and the middle school lens. And so um, there's a lot of research on that now as well. Um, I just wanted to say, I don't think this comes to a surprise to anyone, but I'm also 100% <laughs> in agreement with every, all the dual language and multilingual um, opportunities of growth. Um, and I just, I wish I was a student <laughs> and I was part of these multilingual um, and dual language um, programs. Um, and I just also want to say thank you to Lucy and Christy for all your hard work in all this. And I know this has kind of been new ground in a sense as well. Um, and so, and I think it's exciting that we are um, kind of all in this together and um, really empowering our underserved. You. So thank you, Christy and Lucy, and um, not to cut off any questions, but just it felt like maybe there was a pause there, that one of the things that we would be seeking direction from is about RBG, um, and um, obviously we need to get the de demographer report because we need to understand the capacity issues currently that our schools face and what those projections look like over the next five years. Um, because part of RBG needs to bring relief to um, uh, schools that maybe are exceeding capacity. Um, and so we recognize that we want to see um, what those projections look like. And again, those are projections. So it's not like a you know, 100%, but we can look at what those trends look like and uh, birth rates and things of that nature to determine what um, our future capacities of schools would be. Uh, and then uh, Christy described kind of a concept that um, we just talked about earlier with um, Vita of some sort of priority neighborhood that um, might be layered over the existing boundaries. So it, it wouldn't change where, um, you know, of our 22 current elementary schools, those boundaries would be in place and kids would go to those schools. What would change is how we fill RBG and VITA um, and prioritizing schools maybe with capacity issues or schools with um, students that could benefit from that programming. Um, and then having a tiered approach where, you know, these kids are guaranteed admission, these kids have a priority in it, and these kids are the second priority. Um, and at some point, anybody that would want in would have an opportunity to do that. Um, without affecting the current um, boundaries. And so we need direction um, relatively soon because if we don't have the direction related to um, moving forward with like RBG in that fashion, then we do need to look at, well, then how do we redraw the boundaries uh, to utilize uh, RBG? And then probably RBG would have some sort of strand of dual um, language because of um, the demographics of the school community um, for exactly the reasons that you articulated around Fruit Valley and, and other comments that were made. So we don't necessarily see dual language not being a part of RPG in some way, but the the, the extent, I guess, is, is what we would be looking at. Um, so by the end of the week, we should have that report and I can share it with you. Um, obviously, we'll try to draw some conclusions from the report and um, you know, give some sort of overview, whether we feel like it supports one direction or not. Um, but ultimately, uh, we would ask for your direction. Uh, and then, as Christy and Lucy described, um, a, a cascading of processes afterwards to try to engage stakeholders. Um, so uh, happy to answer any questions about that or uh, any other comments. Um, I just feel like we really do need to see that the demographer's report, and then kind of go from there. Um, so that demographer better get going <laughs> so we can start making decisions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and, and some of this is like kind of like we just need a couple of pieces of the puzzle to fill in, and then we can start doing some of the work associated with that. Um, and then also, you know, some of the feedback that will be ongoing is um, through the strategic planning process that could inform this work as well, that in addition to specific outreach that we do, what in general are people saying about their experiences and where are they finding positive experiences and where are they saying that there are opportunities for us to do better. Um, so lots, I know um, a lot of content tonight, you know, we um, 
uh, intentionally kind of left the, the larger in terms of discussion item for last. Um, but, uh, you know, also thank you for your feedback around the, the student learning formative assessment report. And then thank you for welcoming some of our students. Um, and like I said before, if you're interested in attending um, any of those, I'll add those to the board calendar. And then, you know, obviously, if, if you all want to attend, we would notice that as a public meeting, which, um, you know, I don't think the kids would mind. But uh, if you want to attend like we do in other committees where you rotate through to just get a sense of it. Um, it might be fun for you as well. Um, and with that, I guess we'll turn it back to you, Director Barrows, for any final comments tonight. Yeah, anybody else have anything else before we adjourn? All right, thank you uh, to yeah, everybody yeah. tonight. Great conversation, uh, great information um, across the board, not just the dual language, but in looking at student data and our student advisory. Um, with that, um, we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night.